Hello and welcome to Rights and Recourse, a program that tackles issues affecting your rights and matters of legal recourse. My name is Dumila Matez. Remember, you can also be part of our discussion today by tweeting us at Rights Recourse or calling our studio line on 011-714-5497 or 5498. Alternatively, email your thoughts to Rights and Recourse at sabc.co.za. The 25th African Union Summit focusing on women empowerment and development, which was held in Johannesburg recently, has come and gone, but the summit was overshadowed by the attendance of Sudanese President Omar Hassan al-Bashir, who is wanted by the International Criminal Court for a murderous campaign which left thousands of people dead and one and a half million displaced in Darfur. South Africa's failure to arrest and hand over the Sudanese president to the International Criminal Court has left the government with a hot potato. Not only that, al-Bashir's visit has also sharpened the debate about the ICC's credibility and impartiality, with skeptics accusing the court of only targeting African head of states. Today on Rights and Recourse, we'll look at recent developments and obligations of member countries who signed and ratified the Rome Statute. To unpack these issues, let me welcome here in the studio Ms. Angela Muduguti, who is a lawyer and from the Southern African Litigation Center. We're also joined by Dr. Alfredo Hengari, Senior Research Fellow from the South African Institute of International Affairs. And in our Durban studio, we are joined by Mr. Barnabas Tulu, Director at Tulu Incorporated. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and welcome to Rise and Recourse. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you. First of all, uh, Mr. Kulu, probably I, I hope you can hear us down there in uh, Durban. First of all, it would seem to me at face value that, as our introduction says, probably uh, as we go along, that the President Omar al-Bashir was, in, was in, indicted and implicated by the ICC by association rather than hard evidence as the real perpetrators are the Janjaweed militia. Do you want well, to? Well, uh, um, I think uh, it's a it, it's 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 a very uh, uh, difficult question to uh, to respond to. But first, let me start with uh, the Janjaweed militia, because I think that will give us an idea as to uh, uh, when it comes to the role of uh, President Omar Al Bashir in uh, in, uh, in in the, in the genocide in Darfur. The Janjaweed militia is essentially composed of uh, Arab men. It it means essentially uh, uh, men on horseback with a gun. Uh, it started uh, as a sort of a low intensity type of uh, 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 conflict and, uh, and, and, and massacres committed on what, is tra what was traditionally African uh, 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 um, agricultural communities in, in Darfur. But the scale of the violence increased because uh, there has been uh, some clear uh, evidence of uh, 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 the Njanjaweed being assisted by, by the state. Uh, in the form of uh, the in, in initially when they started with uh, uh, we, they were on horse on horseback, but uh, they started to have four by fours, uh, and they were also accompanied by helicopters. So these are some of the uh, the questions that really uh, uh, started to focus attention to the government in Khartoum. So uh, I think the the scale of the genocide one cannot uh, uh, effectively ignore the role of the state. Do you, do you want to add to that, Angela? Oh well, yes, just to say that um, ICC, the ICC's evidence has implicated President Bashir and connected him to the Janjaweed, offering commands and financial support for their activities. So there is a link that's been made. And also, remember, with international jurisprudence, we often look at the command responsibility doctrine, which then also involves the relevant parties who are pulling the strings, so to speak. And it's not just Bashir. I mean, his Minister of Defense has also been indicted by the ICC. Let, 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 let's, let's get a view from... Uh uh, Mr. Barnabas Tolo in Durban. Mr. Barnabas Tolo, you, you heard the evidence before the ICC. Yes. Yes, um, I have the evidence. The evidence, in fact, uh, was, uh, in fact, the decision that was taken by the, um, by the, the, by the uh, ICC, by the ICC yes. was based on the evidence of, which was referred to by um, the Security Council when the chamber then decided to uh, indict um, uh, President Omar al-Bashir. But that question actually is, is not an issue now, whether there is evidence or no evidence. I thought our focus today would be on 
whether South Africa carried out its obligation and if it didn't, what then is going to be the question after that, if it didn't carry out the, the, its obligation as a member of ICC? We, I, don't, I don't think that we can dwell on the question of uh, what kind and the extent of the evidence uh, at, the, at the moment as, as, as we know how the matter has unfolded. Okay, let, let's, let's leave for a moment. I want to come back to it p later, but I just want to say, Mr. Kulu has raised an issue that this case was referred to the ICC by the UN Security Council. My concern with that is there are, in the UN Security Council, there are seat members who have neither signed nor ratified the Rome Statute. That is a valid concern, but it doesn't negate the fact that the ICC then conducted an independent investigation into Sudan and found that there was evidence of genocide. That was the Kassisi Commission. Yes, and found that there was evidence of genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. So whether or not UN Security Council members have ratified, the point is there is evidence and there are crimes that are being committed and justice has to be done. It is, it is a valid concern that perhaps at the UN Security Council level we see politics at play more than anything else, but the UN Security Council cannot refer a matter and then the ICC take it just because it's come from the UN Security Council. The ICC has to independently evaluate that situation and then indict people. And then they, came, they did the investigation, they came across what you gave us earlier. Yeah, uh, it is true that uh, the, the evidence and also the hard facts show that uh, about 400,000 uh, uh, civilians were killed uh, in, uh, in Darfur. Uh, the evidence also tells us that uh, 1.2 million, 1.5 million uh, 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 internally displaced persons uh, from that region. So I think th this, th th there's a clear case here for Omar al-Bashir to answer. And I think the critical question that possibly would come later in the debate is uh, uh, the, the AU position that was taken at the Extraordinary Summit in 2013, uh, whether that uh, to a certain degree shift uh, the, the CASA to, 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 to another level where uh, uh, African heads of states have to think as to uh, uh, whether the, uh, the, 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 they need to uh, uh, deliver one of their own. W one of the things I want to come to, we'll come to that, but what I want to come to, the, I, I just want us to get over this. W what is the Rome Statute and what role does it play in the arterias to indictments by the ICC? The Rome Statute is the founding treaty what? of the ICC and it basically has built the framework for international criminal justice so it details crimes against humanity, genocide and war crimes, the evidentiary standards, um, the rules and regulations with regard to the Assembly of States parties. So it is, it's the backbone to the International Criminal Court and to the International Criminal Justice Framework we have today. Mr. Gould, you wanted to say something there? Yes, I, yes, yes, I want to say something that uh, it, is an, it is an independent body. Uh, it's not a, a body of the UN and in this case the UN uh, um, supersedes whatever uh, is decided by the ICC. Now, the challenges that we are dealing with now are primarily caused by that because in terms of the UN or in terms of the uh, customary international law, the head of state enjoys immunity. And that is in terms of the UN uh, uh, UN uh, international uh, um, international um, customary law. Now, the question that you should be asking ourselves is whether Omar Al Bashir enjoys that protection, which is which, which is there in in the, in the rules of of customary international law. Thank you very much. Before uh, my view, my yes, view is that he, he, he does. does enjoy that immunity. Mm. Let me come back to something we said when we were off air regarding the Rome Statute. What, what are countries who are signatories and who have ratified the Rome Statute supposed to be doing? Before I get to that, I'd just like to contradict my learned colleague. The UN Security Council referral 1593 of President Omar Bashir removes his immunity. So there is no immunity in his case. Well, well I, I, I have a different view with due respect, my learned friend, um, <laughs> in the following. In the following, because there is no way uh, the, the Security Council, for that matter, can delegate its powers or its authority to the, to the uh, ICC, because ICC is not competent to receive that power. We'll come, to that. we'll come to that. I think there's a difference of opinion here. We'll come to that. But let us, let us go back to the Rome Statute. Yes. Earlier, before we came on air, we had a, yes. how do countries domesticate? The Rome Statutes. 
Very simple. They integrate it into their domestic law. Usually they integrate it into their Criminal Procedure Act or their Criminal Code. So it becomes domestic law. So they look at the Rome Statute text and they incorporate it in such a way that it complies with domestic law regulations, as South Africa has done. South Africa has done that, uh, uh, Mr. Kulu, down in the South Africa has done that by creating Act Number 27, which actually is the implementation of the Rome Statute, and it's in, it's within yes. our legislation. Do you want to comment on that? That that that, that is correct. Uh, but uh, where there is conflict, like it is the case now, where there is conflict, the UN Charter uh, supersedes or has supremacy over whatever the uh, ICC provides. Let us get over this UN Charter thing, Dr. Hengari. You, 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 the UN Charter, as we all know it, actually is 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 a very broad principle of the UN. Now, the the the, the Rome Statute is a very specific statute that says all member states have an obligation to arrest anybody who is, who is a fugitive to on, to justice internationally. Well, that that is uh, uh, quite correct, and in the case of South Africa, where uh, uh, the treaty has been domesticated even more so. Uh, but the critical issue here is uh, the, the, the manner in which uh, the ICC over the past few years have been contested by African, uh, African heads of states and spe specifically the African Union. So I think it, it, is, uh, it raises a number of uh, conundrums when it comes to uh, the application of, uh, of, of, of of, of uh, the, 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 the right application of, uh, of the statute, especially in the case of South Africa. I do think that the key turning point in my view was uh, the, the case of Uhuru. That's when uh, African heads of states uh, said enough is enough because uh, uh, there are clear suggestions that uh, the ICC did not have sufficient evidence to prosecute uh, uh, Uhuru Kenyatta. And that raises the, that raised uh, a number of eyebrows in African capitals. So I think my view is that uh, the, the the there has been a turning point. So I don't think that uh, we'll come uh, we, back to we that. can I'm sorry to, to interrupt you. We'll come back to that when we come back from the break. If you'd like to join us today's is on today's discussion, you can please call us on 011 714 5497 or 5498 or tweet us at Rights Records. Stay with us. sacrificed in the name of Bashir. Welcome back, and uh, we are discussing the issue of the ICC and the President Omar al-Bashir from Sudan. With us here in the studio is uh, Dr. Shiruma, uh, I don't know whether I've got that right now, Shiruma Hangari and uh, Angela uh, Mudukuti. And down in Durban, with what Mr. Bonapas told it would seem to me, despite the fact that there are 31 African countries that have signed and ratified the Rome Statute, some have signed, some have not ratified, some have signed the Rome Statute, that the opposition to the ICC is rather self serving. Am I right? Am I wrong? Mr. Kulu, you are coming there? In, 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 in this case, uh, for instance, um, Sudan is not a member of the ICC. So it is not uh, bound by what the ICC decides. Uh, it, it is then not affected by whatever decision that the ICC takes. That is why there is now a problem with this indictment, because it is only applicable solely to those people who are members, or to states that are members. And the, 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 the UN Charter excludes uh, um, 
uh, decisions by ICC to affect its members as such. How difficult? Yes, they have agreements. They, 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 there is an agreement between ICC and the UN, but even that agreement does not take away the obligations of the member states in the UN uh, to be filtered into, the, into those who are members of the ICC. So the starting point really is to look at the framework of, of, of taking from the UN Charter and all conventions there as well as uh, agreements arising from the, uh, from the Charter before you even go to the um, ICC. I, so will, I, will, I, will, I, 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 what? I would want to make, at some stage, uh, Mr. Kulu, I want you to make the connection between the UN Charter and the ICC and the Rome Statute so that we, we are at the same wavelength because I'm trying to find the link between the, the Charter and the ICC and the Rome, Rome Statute. But let's go ahead. Let, I want, the question I wanted to ask, first of all, is how difficult does it make it for the ICC that does not have law enforcement agencies to, to make this job of prosecutorial prosecutor, prosecutor to real op op authority work rather than relying on member states to make the arrests? It does make it very difficult for the court, but the beauty of the court is that it works on a system of cooperation. And we are moving towards a model where we don't force people to do things, but people agree to it and then adhere to it, where, which I think is personally a more progressive model but as we see now in reality it doesn't always play out the way you would hope it would but ideally states would adhere to their responsibilities and in this case South Africa would have arrested President Omar al-Bashir. But why did South Africa not do its obligation, meet its obligations? I think it's, it's a, it's a, it's a because, political question. Uh, 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 as, as, we, as we know South Africa was part of uh, the decision in 2013 uh, uh, where the, the AU decision, where the, a, the, AU, the AU decision at an extraordinary summit, where leaders agreed that no sitting head of state must be tried by the ICC, and I think uh, that also opened uh, uh, some opportunity for possibly better cooperation once the head of state, the the, the 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 indicted head of state is no longer in office. So I think that was the thinking behind that type of position, because clearly, as I had mentioned earlier, uh, the case of Uru was a turning point. Uh, uh, where African leaders felt that uh, this is just not correct because... Uh, well, we'll come back to that. Uh, uh, Mr. Kulu, I know you wanted to say something. I'll come back to that. There's a call on the line. Noah, good afternoon and welcome to Rights and Recourse. Hello, how are you? Fine, thanks. How are you? Yes, I just want to contribute um, on, on Bashiri. Uh, I'm, finding, I'm finding from Johannesburg. Yes. Yes. I, I think uh, no, they should have not invited him in the first place. Because this, uh, as I see it, it's an embarrassment, you know. Uh, because these things, it, it, it will say South African government doesn't allow, doesn't respect the court of law in other ways. But I think the best way it should have, it, it was supposed to be, they should have not invited him into the South African soils. soils. Thank and you very much. What, Thank you very much, Noah. Thank you. We got your gist of your question there. Uh, Mr. Kulu, Noah says, I think you can combine this with your answer you wanted to give us the last time. Uh, President Omar al-Bashir should not have been invited to South Africa in the first place. That, that, that is not correct. He's protected as the head of state. The Geneva, the Geneva uh, Convention protects him. The customary international law protects him. He's the head of states currently. He cannot be charged by foreign governments uh, as, 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 as it is. Uh, he's excluded from that criminal jurisdiction. Now, uh, the AU, in the AU, he was participating, uh, the executing his uh, diplomatic uh, mission, uh, and he enjoys the protection. The, the, the arrest of um, uh, President Omar al-Bashir is basically at the behest of the Security Council. We've seen other tribunals that were established by the uh, UN. They were effective because they were deriving the power from the Security Council and it, it was more of an extension. The ICC is not uh, the extension of the UN. Now, if we are a member state in the UN, you'll focus or the obligations that are created by the UN to you as the member. And in this case, South Africa uh, was relying 
on the UN provisions or, or conventions, which, which actually gives immunity. I don't to, think um, I, I don't think South Africa is relying on the Omar UN. Provisions. No, absolutely not. And I have to interject again because the Geneva Conventions have nothing to do with immunity. Geneva Conventions are about war crimes. And secondly, South Africa was relying on this government gazette that they promulgated in June that gave, supposedly gave immunity to Bashir. But that never passed through both houses of parliament, so cannot be law. If the executive could just promulgate something in the gov government gazette and it becomes law tomorrow, we'd be subject to all sorts of things. For something to become law in the Republic, it must go through both houses of parliament. That immunity government gazette clause did not go through through this process. And even if it had, it would still be unconstitutional and invalid. And so South Africa, the, the legal representatives from the state didn't make any submissions about the UN Charter. Their focus of their argument was that there is immunity based on the promulgation of this government gazette. Talking about that, uh, now that South Africa has promulgated the uh, Rome Statute into their own legislation, how difficult is it going to be for South Africa to change that and withdraw from the ICC? as there's been called, make calls made that South Africa withdraw. There is a process. Once again, it has to go through both houses of parliament and then the executive has to sign on it. And then they have to write a letter to Ban Ki-moon the, indicating their intention to withdraw. And only a year after that letter has been handed in is withdrawal effective. So it's a long process. It can't happen overnight. Let us take this call from Sipo from Johannesburg. Sipo, good afternoon and welcome to Rights and Recourse. Hello, Sipo. Hello. Yes, Sipo, how are you? Can Hello, you? Uh, I'm fine, thank you. How are you? Fine, thank you. Can you ask your question? Uh, my, my, my comment uh, is uh, just to add that Gosazana uh, Zoom made it very clear that uh, uh, in addition to Alpashi um, enjoying as a head of state uh, in immunity, diplomatic immunity and so on, there was also in addition the one he enjoyed from the AU. One must also remember, this is against the background, that uh, at some stage we had uh, George Bush uh, Jr. coming here, we had uh, Tony Blair, that many people, including the International Human Rights uh, uh, Commission, had actually asked that they should be arrested. And this wasn't done. The IC didn't push this, you know. So here, yeah, sorry, 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 we don't, uh, sorry, 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 we don't want you to sidetrack us because there's no indictment against George Bush. There's no indictment against Tony Blair. Let, let's get that clear quickly. Yeah, that is uh, that is correct. There's no indictment against uh, uh, Tony Blair or George Bush Jr. So I think uh, it's uh, that argument is slightly invalid. The case of uh, of Omar El Bashir is quite clear. And, and in terms of South Africa's law, uh, South Africa had the obligation to, uh, to arrest Omar al-Bashir. The decision was what that was taken is, is one that is m largely political. It had to do with uh, South Africa's own foreign policy considerations in Africa. I want to come to the foreign policy issue and we come back. If you'd like to join us, you can call us on today's discussion on 11 or 5498 or tweet us at Rights Recourse or email your thoughts to Rights Recourse at sabc.co.za. Stay with us. Street culture is most definitely defined through one's individual style, be it through music, lifestyle and fashion. Live Magazine has been in existence since 2010. It is a youth-run media channel covering a range of topics from fashion, politics. We need, and there's a huge gap in South Africa, skilled museum personnel, such as collections and manager restorers. That is a gap. Pattern of Contact includes the 14th century Chinese world map. This is one of the oldest surviving world maps titled Da Ming Hun Yi Tu. Join Musam Khalifi on Afro Show Biz every Saturday at 19.30 CAT.
Welcome back. And last now, first here, the Twitter community has what the Twitter community has to say on this issue. Uh, the uh, Snoopy says, who will be sacrificed in the name of Bashir? Uh, Tony Roberts uh, says, no use. Zuma made up his mind about everything. That's why SA is, fa is, is failing. Uh, and then Snoopy again. Snoopy is a tweeter. Just one Q. Who is in charge of our justice system? JZ or Mukweng Mukweng. Why is the government investigating Al Bashir's escape? What questions would you like to ask our panelists? Oh, that's a question we asked them. And that's uh, the, uh, what the Twitter community is saying. Uh, Angela, you wanted to clarify something around the invitation to President Al Bashir. Absolutely. The first caller raised it, and I think that's a very fair point because we saw that in 2009 for President Jacob Zuma's inauguration, Bashir was invited. But the DG of Durko made it clear that if he comes, he will be arrested. Bashir didn't come. Same thing in 2010 with the World Cup. He was invited, but it was also made explicitly clear that should he come, he will be arrested. So which is why this debacle that we have now is highly irregular when we look at South Africa's behavior in the past with Bashir. Mr. Kulu, he was invited for the inauguration of the president, was invited for the World Cup. Uh, why was, did he not come? Why did he not force him and come? Because he was invited by South Africa. Well, Firstly, I don't hold any brief from uh, President Omar al-Bashir. We respect that. My, my comment is just an opinion based on the international law practice uh, of what is supposed to happen. Um, I, I will know the facts really uh, related to that specific incident or those two incidents. Uh, all that I'm saying is um, if I was South Africa, because if they've effected this arrest, uh, the uh, Sudan government may have easily referred them to the international criminal, uh, uh, the, inter the international um, court of justice for the breach of what is uh, there in the um, United Charter and, 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 and the rules uh, dealing with the uh, customary international law. There is a call so, on the line. Uh, Dr. Mr. Tulu, thank you very much. I'll come back to you. My apology for interrupting you. There is a call on the line, but I first want to understand this. Would it, what role did the xenophobia incident in South Africa a couple of months ago had to do with this decision? Well, uh, I think one can only speculate that uh, it might have played a minor role in terms of uh, the overall decision taken, uh, because it's important to also know that uh, uh, South Africa did take a bit of uh, a beating in terms of its image on the African continent. Uh, there has been some, uh, when you travel to some African capitals, uh, they will tell you that South Africa is not African enough. Uh, you have all sorts of, uh, of, uh, uh, of, uh, of adjectives used to describe South Africa. And uh, that has to do with uh, some of the, uh, the issues that make South Africa also South Africa, which is, for example, the, the issues of rule of law, uh, uh, a democracy that is uh, uh, functioning much better than many African, African countries. So uh, uh, for South Africa to think about arresting Omar al-Bashir in that climate where South Africa is also uh, uh, has expectations of itself in terms of the role on the African continent, uh, to see itself as a, as, a, as a protector of African interest. And I think uh, the, the position that was taken by African leaders when it comes to the ICC uh, is one that seeks to affirm Africa vis-a-vis -vis, you know, what is now seen as a, as a Western, uh, a pro-Western institution. Dr. Hilary, let's, let's take this call from the Eastern Cape. No, 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 no. Good afternoon and welcome to Rights and Recalls. Good, good, good afternoon. Thank you very much. As a listener, you know what, yeah? the only interest that I'm having with your panel is what interest is the South African media have it have? Do they have an interest of Africa or do they have a European or an American interest? That's it. Because to me, you take your big thank, thank, thank you, no, no, thank, thank, thank you, no, no. Yeah. We got your question. Your question is what interest does the media have? And I think the media has a great deal of interest in terms of the adherence to the rule of law. Absolutely, because South Africa domesticated the Rome Statute and has taken it upon himself, itself to adhere to these obligations. And so this is a rule of law question, which is why the court ruled in our favor that they should have arrested Bashir because the law on this is clear. So South Africa has obligations. So in a sense, this is less about Bashir, but more about South Africa's obligations as a signatory to the Rome Statute and as a nation that's domesticated the Rome Statute of the ICC. We've got a lawyer down in Durban. Uh, Mr. Tulu, the court ruled on Saturday that uh, uh, 
it ruled on Friday. Was it Saturday or Friday? Sunday. 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 Sunday that the president Omar al Bashir should not be allowed to leave South Africa. And uh, it would seem to me we do not adhere to a fundamental issue of the rule of law. What's your view? Well, on the face of it, it looks like that. Uh, South African government needs to explain. Uh, I've just pointed out uh, what I, I, I am of the view strongly that there was no way this, this arrest was going to be lawful because the resolution by the, um, by the, by the Security Council to the security this Council. to ICC was, yes, was, was, was the, 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 the resolution 1593 was ultra virase. Uh, there is no way in which they could have waived uh, the, the immunity of the head of state. So on the face of it, the, 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 the order of the court was supposed to be uh, respected by the South African government, but they, they have a chance now to explain why they have not complied. I think and I want to go I, back to something you raised. Uh, my my apologies. Reasons. I want to go back to something you made uh, around the issue of the Security Council. I also made that announcement. I didn't get your view on that. And that is why would the Security Council refer a matter to the ICC when there are members sitting at the Security Council who have not signed, neither ratified the Rome Statute? That is what has placed uh, this whole case into this dilemma. Um, Possibly politics uh, has had a, a role to play in that regard, but because ICC is not a body of the uh, United Nations, so it can't assume any obligations that are created to member states in the UN Charter. It can't assume. It doesn't have competence. I think let me, let me, let me come back to Angela on that. Let me come back to Angela. Angela, you said if South Africa were to withdraw, they'll have to write a letter to the Secretary General of the UN. Now, that, gives, that brings the connection between the UN and the court. Yes, I have to once again disagree with my learned colleague. There is a connection with the two. There are three ways in which something can come before the ICC. A United Nations Security Council referral, as per the Rome Statute. A self-referral, where a nation independently subjects itself to the jurisdiction of the court. Or the prosecutor can exercise their jurisdiction in a country that has signed and ratified the Rome Statute. So what we see with Bashir and Sudan is that UN, UN, United Nations Security Council referral, which is legitimized because it's stipulated as such in the Rome Statute. I want to come to something you mentioned just now, where a... a a, a nations can subject themselves to the jurisdiction of the court. I, we saw that happening with, uh, with Cote d'Ivoire with respect to uh, President Gbagbo. Yes, Cote d'Ivoire, Uganda, Mali, there are several examples, Central African Republic, all self-referrals. Mm. Earlier we spoke about, I want to come back to this issue of the, of the, of the South Africa's foreign, foreign policy. We spoke about the foreign policy, despite the declaration by President Mandela that South Africa's foreign policy will be guided by human rights ethos, and this was evident during his administration. Has something changed in the South African foreign policy? Well, um, it's, 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 it's very difficult to say that uh, something has changed. But uh, at the time when uh, Nelson Mandela was uh, talking about the use of human rights, South Africa was not yet an active player on the African continent. So the terrain in Africa and South Africa's initiative started to encounter problems in Africa when it comes to some of the values that are quite central in South Africa's foreign policy. So the, the critical question became also, how do we engage Africa when we put issues of human rights in front? We might run into problems, so maybe we have to rethink uh, uh, the, 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 the engagement strategies when it comes to some of these countries, because you cannot talk uh, peace in Sudan, for example and then you elevate issues of human rights uh, in front of uh, Omar al-Bashir, I don't think that he's likely to listen to you. So South Africa's agency in Africa was constrained by the realities on the ground. So I don't think that South Africa has, has in any way uh, 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 um, uh, devalued issues of human rights in Africa. I don't think so. I think it, it's a question of, uh, uh, of the diplomatic engagements of the country uh, where the country started to, 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 to encounter serious problems. Well, we saw actually at that time when President Mandela was the president of South Africa, his uh, outgoing criticism of Nigeria at the Commonwealth, at the Commonwealth uh, Summit in, uh, where he actually led, that led to Nigeria being suspended and Nigeria refused to send their soccer team to come and play in the African Nations Cup in 1996.
Yeah, that's a, that's a very good example where uh, uh, possibly the first encounter South Africa had when it comes to uh, issues of human rights in Africa. And I think pr after that, there was a clear revision of uh, South Africa's engagement strategy because uh, Nigeria did not uh, take South Africa's interference in Nigeria's domestic affairs kindly. And uh, uh, there has been a, a clear shift in, in, in South Africa's foreign policy when it comes to issues of human rights, not to diminish them, but to sort of let's try and see how we can domesticate issues of human rights at the AU level instead of South Africa being the country that, uh, that, that, that speaks on issues of human rights, uh, uh, risking the eye of other African countries. I get a sense here, Angela, that uh, South Africa finds itself between a rock and a hard place with its constitutional institutions and solidarity with its neighbors that frown on upon and perceive the, the ICC as Western interference in their domestic affairs or in their sovereignty. Some people have said that, but I, I think I, I have to disagree because obviously if you look at the AU Constitutive Act, it talks about accountability, justice, and bringing an end to, an impuni to impunity. So how does this, this debacle correlate with South Africa's so-called obligations at the AU level? Uh, I think there is a lot of inconsistency. I think it's a game of politics, unfortunately. I think the law and the greater good is clear. Justice and accountability is necessary, and South Africa had a chance to do that. Mr. Tulu down in Durban, quickly, uh, I don't know whether you want to respond to this issue of the change in the in this foreign policy of South Africa. No, I will have much comment on that. Uh, my take is just on the observing the law as, as it stands. Um, the immunity is a reality. Um, there was no way, I mean, this arrest could have been legal uh, by the South African government. On the change of policy dealing with um, human rights and the African continent. The organizations like the South African uh, Litigation Center could not have assumed the obligations of the South African government as, as they were trying to do in law. I, I don't know on what basis uh, they've assumed those obligations because there is no way, even in the ICC, uh, 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 ICC as, 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 as the International Criminal Court does not extend its powers to organizations like uh, the uh, South African Litigation Center. I, I think so I, that I, remains... I, uh, mm. I just want, I don't want this to be a discussion between Mr. Kulu and the South African, Southern African Litigation Center, but I want to go back to the Constitution, the South African, the, uh, the South African Constitution. The Rome Statute aside, subsection 5 of the Constitution goes further to say, I think I quoted one other section of the Constitution, section 165, subsection 2. And subsection 5 says, uh, f goes further to say that an order or decision of the court binds all persons to whom and, and to whom and organs of state to which it applies. Is government in contempt of court here? Government could potentially be in contempt of court. We're waiting for the court to issue the reasons for its order, and we're also waiting for an affidavit that the state is due to submit next week that explains exactly how President Omar al-Bashir escaped and who's responsible for that. So pending that, we can't make a decision or a declaration as to whether there's contempt of court, but we need to wait for those documents. And I must seize the opportunity to explain the Southern Africa Litigation Center's role in all of this. The Constitution of South Africa gives human rights organizations locus standi to bring interests, to bring cases that are in the public interest before the court. And that's exactly what we did. Justice and accountability are in the public interest. Mr. Kulu, I think you heard that comment there, but I want to bring, I want to add to that in that probably it is in the interest of civil society to bring, to interpret their own constitution. And when you interpret your own constitution and your law, you have a right to bring a case to court against anybody. Uh, 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 that, 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 is, that is correct, but they have they observed the existence of this uh, head of state immunity? I don't think the, 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 f probably one of the other things that has not been done is to explain the, the African Union's own uh, immunity details. I think you spoke about they stand for humanity and uh, justice and all of that's what they say in their founding documents, but we haven't seen that, have we? Yes, and, and as I indicated before, the law is very clear, which is why the court found in our favor that immunity is not applicable in this situation. So I think we need to, two, one, look at the judgment, and two, understand that 
sort of directly attacking the Southern Africa Litigation Center doesn't further the cause, anybody's cause. We need to look at the law and look at the judgment. So immunity does not apply in this situation, which is why the court found in our favor. The, the Dr. Heringa. Was not uh, going to be applicable. No, go so ahead. Go ahead, Mr. Kuhn. Go ahead. The, 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 the immunity was not going to be applicable only if it is waived by the Sudanese government. In this case, it did not waive uh, immunity to protect uh, Omar al-Bashir and other members of the, of, of the cabinet because they are protected. It, the only stage where this could have been waived is when the state itself consented to that. And in this case, it has not consented. Let's and in as much as the uh, UN could not have waived it, the, 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 the UN and the Security Council could not have waived the immunity which protects Omar al-Bashir. Let's come back to something else, uh, Dr. Heringa. Dr. Heringa, there has been a general call from, amongst others, no less a person than the President of Zimbabwe and Chairman of the AU, uh, that African countries should withdraw and block from the ICC. Could this be the only solution? I don't think that it's the, 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 the only solution. Uh, and that position is not new. In 2013, uh, when uh, President Uhuru Kenyatta and uh, his deputy, and his deputy William, Ruto. William Ruto, uh, 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 were, were indicted by the ICC. A number of African countries were pushing for withdrawal. And that's why that extraordinary summit was called in October. It was to discuss the ICC, Africa's position on the ICC in particular. And it's important to mention here that South Africa was one of the countries that insisted that uh, uh, we should not uh, withdraw from the ICC in the absence of other solid legal instruments on the African continent to deal with issues of impunity. So I think today the, 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 the question of withdrawal in my view is no longer one that is, no longer one that is urgent uh, because uh, uh, the, 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 the question that was really the turning point as I had mentioned earlier was Uhuru Kenyatta because prior to that there were no calls on the part of African countries to withdraw from the ICC because the issue of Omar al-Bashir uh, clearly divides the African continent. They are African, I, th I do believe sincerely that the African leaders who believe that uh, President Omar al Bashir has a case to answer in Darfur. So, who was a turning point because we are dealing with a, a democracy here that is quite respectable. And also the, uh, the overzealousness of Ocampo at the time. I we wanted to come to that. that. I'll, well, I'll come to the overzealousness of Moreno Ocampo. Uh, if you'd like to join us, you can please call us on 011 or 5498 or tweet us at Rights and Rights Recourse and email us on Rights and Recourse at sabc.co.za. After the break, AU spokesperson shared light on the stance of the AU on President Omar al Bashir so that we don't put words in their mouths. Fly over Fervood. Let's now have a look at this. Now, Fervood, uh, the comment yesterday in Janji, Mr. Sparks lived up to his name and yes. caused quite a few sparks. It was quite shocking for me to hear him compare H.F. Fervood uh, um, to Helen Zeller in terms of her or orator skills. Mugabe to compensate white farmers for land grab. I don't know if I'm justified to call it truth and rec <laughs> reconciliation Mugabe style. Watch Media Monitor with me, Alicia Jali, Sundays at 9 a.m. only on the SABC News Channel. Welcome back. AU spokesperson Jacob Enno Eburn shared light on the stance of the AU on President Omar al-Bashir. The last couple of summits of the African Union heads of state have had this issue as part of the agenda, just talking about Africa's relations with, with the ICC and to redefine it. And that's why an enormous pressure was put for President, the, uh, President Kenyatta's trial to be dropped, which is, has been dropped. And so we're working now on other cases, uh, the, the Deputy President of Kenya, as well as uh, that of uh, President uh, uh, al-Bashi. And for us, and it's not to communicate that the African Union supports impunity. In fact, 
um, if you look at the Constitutive Act, we are moving forward to having an African court where uh, we are going to have such issues. I don't know if those distractors, detractors who are talking about the AU and uh, uh, um, supposed promulgation of uh, impunity are looking at the, uh, the trial of uh, Isana Brain that's currently taking place in, in, in Senegal. Okay? Just, just to tell the public and the rest of the world that the AU doesn't um, promote uh, impunity, but then we are working to ensure that our continent uh, uh, really achieve some of its goals, uh, those its goals of integration, development and for that matter the theme for this year is women's empowerment and development towards Agenda 2063 and would really like to focus on this. Well, you heard there Ibn Idu talking about Hassan Harbour. Hassan Harbour was the president of Chad who was being tried in uh, Senegal. That's after many, many years. Well, uh, let's take this call from, before we comment on what he said, let's take this call from, from Fernando in Durban. Fernando, good afternoon and welcome to Rights and Recourse. Good day. How are you, sir? What is your question? Good afternoon. Yes, uh, good I afternoon. just want to ask the lawyer a question uh, from Durban that if an uh, order was issued by a high court that he is not to leave the country and if a full bench of judges have found him to be arrested, how can the lawyer then say it's not uh, valid? And if that is the case, that if a full bench of judges and a high court judge is wrong, then we are really, really in trouble in this country. Thank you, Fernando. Doctor, uh, Mr. Kulu, you heard that question from Fernando. I think it was directed to you. Yes, yes, I've, I've, I've heard the question. Uh, the court order remains to be answered. They, they still have to give explanation how did he get out of the country. Now, I've said to it, on the face of it, it will seem as if the South African government have committed a, a, an attempt, a, 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 a contempt of the, of, of the court order. But we don't know what is their explanation, and I think we should be respecting uh, the opportunity which is given now to the South African government to provide its explanation. Well, I think Mr. K Mr. Kulu is right. We cannot uh, preempt the fact that the South African government is in contempt of court until the court says so, until probably you guys bring your application to the court. You wanted to say something around that? I wanted to actually discuss uh, this idea of withdrawal. Of African oh, the withdrawal idea of withdrawal ICC, from yes. the ICC. And just to say that it's potentially the worst thing the African continent would do, because if we look at the SADC tribunal, that's been, somebody, it's been disbanded, and if it comes into existence again, it will only be a court that will hear interstate disputes, removing that individual access. So what will individual victims do then? We look at this African court that the AU representative has just spoken about. That African court currently doesn't have criminal jurisdiction. And the protocol that will give it criminal jurisdiction includes immunity for heads of state and senior government officials. Now the definition of senior government officials is very broad. Immunity for heads of state when people stay in power for 30 or 40 years, evidence disappears, witnesses die. How does this make sense for a continent that's trying to encourage justice and accountability? Well, yes, I wanted to come to exactly that point. That is, the, this African Court for Human, People, for Human and People's Rights was established in 1998, but to date, we have not seen no cases before this court. And 1998 is a long time, nearly 10 years ago. Oh, it's busy with cases, but not criminal cases. So cases which then result in damages, like civil award, civil award of damages. Just want to explain something else here for our viewers, and that uh, Angela may mention of the uh, SADC tribunal. The SADC tribunal had the case of the farmers from Zimbabwe, that ma and it made findings, and those findings were just ignored. How can we then expect a, an African court to... I'm not saying an African court won't, won't be able to solve issues. Um, well, I think it's... Uh, it, it, as Angela uh, rightly pointed out, uh, there is uh, in Africa, there has been for a very long time a culture of, uh, of a state-centric approach to uh, dealing with uh, uh, human rights issues. And uh, the ICC somehow uh, covered that gap quite, uh, quite well. And that's why Africa's withdrawal from the ICC will be, uh, um, should be seen as an insult to ordinary Africans who at times suffer at the hands of unaccountable regimes. And, and I think it also goes against uh, some of the commitments 
uh, that Africa or the AU has made in terms of its own act, you know, where it talks about issues of, uh, of non-indifference when it comes to large-scale abuses of human rights. So I think there is uh, at times a, a clear contradiction between the commitment that African leaders uh, have made when it comes to civilians and also the commitments that they have towards each other, which is the state, the very state-centric state aspect that they at times try to promote. Angela, what I concerned me, I've got nothing against women, was there are very real issues facing this continent of Africa. Uh, we've seen what is happening in North Africa, in Libya, in, uh, in, in, in Tunisia, and all of the, that part of the world, and also in Nigeria. We've seen thousands of Africans drowning in the Mediterranean Sea. We've seen a whole lot of these things happening. And Africa is busy talking about uh, w uh, women development when they see these cases are right in front of them. I think it was fair that the summit was themed accordingly. I think the AU focuses on certain issues at certain times. And it's not to say that just because the summit had a particular title that they didn't discuss other things. So I think, broadly speaking, these issues are being canvassed. Mr. Kulu, do you want to say something around that? Um, yeah, look, I Probably mean, around the court, around the African Court for Human uh, and People's Rights. Yes. Well, look, a AU is a, a regional, or is, 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 a, is a regional arrangement of the uh, United Nations. Um, she was correct, uh, uh, Angela was correct when she said, then it will inherit all that is there provided in the in the in the UN. So, which means uh, the, the the revision or, or the removal of this protection uh, which exists now can only be dealt with by the UN at its level in 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 the in, the, um, in its assembly to 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 remove this immunity because the AU cannot like all its member states are members of the UN. They cannot uh, uh, overrule the supremacy of the, of, of the UN provision. So the court that will be established, uh, or the established court in, in Africa, will have to observe uh, uh, those uh, uh, rules and uh, uh, the principles which, which are well, now well founded. I want to go back to that, but I want to take this call from Bongani, Kwazulu Natal. Bongani, good afternoon and welcome to Rights and Recourse. Good afternoon and to your guest. Thank you. What is your question? No, no, it's not a question, actually. It's, I just want to add something on this issue. Yes. It's not a question. I mean, uh, you know, firstly, I would like uh, to thank the guests. At least now you have come to a conclusion that we, let us not judge the government in terms of action taken till they, they explain their position. Yes. But the first important thing that I want to mention is that I, I, I'm behind. I, I'll recommend that AU withdraw its members from the uh, ICC because we had so many cases of like uh, Iraq, I have to mention one, where these big countries uh, like America and then and, and British and then those countries are apart uh, without like a, a UN uh, uh, directive. You know, so with that and then all those people that have never been brought to ICC, we've never seen that. Most you see is African countries and, and that are also uh, are always called it up to this court. Thank you very much, Bongani. Thank you, Bongani. We've heard your question, Bongani, talking about a withdrawal. But I want to go back to something very quickly that uh, Mr. Kulu mentioned, and that is the, the immunity to the head of state cannot be removed by the, uh, the court. But I think if the Security Council, a high-ranking body of the UN, refers a case to this ICC, that means that immunity has been withdrawn. Absolutely. It's very, it's that simple, as simply as you have explained it. Yes. Quickly, we are running out of time, but I wanted to say, I wanted to ask one. Not, can, I, can, I, can I clarify yes, this for the last time? It, it, it is not because ICC is not a body of the UN, so it is not competent to receive the authority from, 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 from UN. It, it would seem to me we'll argue the, about the, that point, because if we argue that point throughout this program. Yeah. What then, this, this whole issue, what does it make of South Africa's stature internationally? Well, there, is, uh, uh, there are two issues here. Uh, one of them is uh, uh, South Africa did uh, uh, take uh, a bit of flag in terms of its own commitment to rule of law uh, 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 at home. Uh, certainly there, there has been some damage there. 
uh, because government ignored uh, its own court. Uh, but at the same time, there is, a, there is an explanation for that, which is largely political, as I had mentioned. Uh, South Africa is also worried about uh, how it's seen, perceived by its own African peers. Uh, so to arrest uh, a sitting head of state uh, when there is a position, even if it's not legal, if, even if it doesn't commit South Africa legally at, at home, there is an African position that has a certain, uh, there is a there is political I wanted to there. give the final word to Angela. I'm sorry to be interrupting you. I think South Africa's reputation has been significantly damaged by this event because we always talk about South Africa as a constitutional democracy built on respect for human rights and dignity and accountability and justice. And given the history of this country and the legacy of apartheid, it's very important for South Africa to maintain that respect for justice and accountability. Well, it's surely clear that we are not going to solve the problems around this issue here in the studio and this program. It's been an hour long that has been going on, but uh, we're hoping that we will see what the solution is going to be from the African court, which I thought could be complementary to the ICC. This has been Rights and Recourse. This program is repeated at 10 tonight and 5 on Monday morning. From all of us in the studio, thank you to our guests and good afternoon.